All right, well now that I've got my food, I think it's time to start. Um, my name is Hank Greeley, I'm director of the Center for Law and the Biosciences. I want to welcome you to uh, a slightly skewed version of our usual Tuesday uh, journal club. It's skewed both because it's on Tuesday and because we're not really doing a journal club exactly. Uh, but we have the very good fortune of being able to get Dr. David Roman uh, to come talk about this new avian flu research and uh, publication of that research. You have seen this all over the newspapers, I suspect, in the last month or so, uh, about a genetically modified version of the avian influenza which does the one thing that the avian influenza happily hadn't been able to do very well, which was move from person to person. I won't go into the science, I'm sure David will go into that more, other than to say, he said I don't know really whether it moves from person to person, but it moves awfully well from ferret to ferret, uh, which is enough to make us very nervous. This has led to a variety of discussion about limitations on what should be published, as well as some deeper discussion about whether this is appropriate research to do at all. Now, David is a professor of medicine here at Stanford in the Division of Infectious Disease, who studies something that I personally find <laughs> even more fascinating than avian flu. He studies our microbiomes. His main love in life is all the little beasties that live inside us, uh, which is deeply interesting, although maybe not the best lunch conversation. <laughs> no, it's a perfect lunch conversation. <laughs> if you love this area, it's the perfect lunch conversation. But also, for for Sims, uh, and I don't know what these Sims were, years ago David became a member of the National, oh, let's get this wrong, the National something for National, I'll, I'll go into that. National Security Advisory Board of Bioscience. It's the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. So all those words are right, but just the order is wrong, uh, which was set up actually to provide advice to the federal government and others about what to do with respect to dual use biological research and the publication thereof. And so it, he's been very active in that role as well as in really interesting issues like investigation of uh, the anthrax um, terrorist actions in 2001. And has managed to do lots of fascinating stuff. This is the third time we've been able to drag him over to law school for various events. And I can say, based on that past experience, that uh, you're in for an interesting hour, Dr. Rowe. Oh, and I should also say, this past year, right, you were elected to the Institute of Medicine. Congratulations. Hank is um, very kind, and um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I, I'd like this to be informal, as informal as it can be, and I want to make sure to save time for a discussion. I really don't want to or plan to present you a lot of slides, but I, I put together about 18 slides, some of which are very brief, simply for the purpose of, of trying to give you a little bit of the background to these issues, because I think they're important, and there has been a great deal that's been discussed about the, the more general issues surrounding these particular papers. And I, so I thought that would be a valuable thing to do. But you can you know, do this to tell me just to move along if, if this is old hat or it doesn't seem um, particularly of value. Uh, and, and also, just as, as by means of disclaimer, um, my, my work for a number of years now has been on the beneficial microbes of the human body. I, I, I did start my research career here at Stanford working on disease-causing organisms. So I have some familiarity with the, the dark side of the microbial world and, um, and a bit on mechanisms of, of pathogenesis, but it's more from the bacterial world. I, all of this to say, I'm not an influenza uh, virologist, per se. And there may be technical issues about which I know something, but not enough. And I'll try to make that clear. The other thing that I've done a little of over the last 15 years is serve in advisory roles for the US government. And um, unfortunately, fortunately, um, most of these roles are usually um, couched around the, the potential problems and threats associated with the dark side, not so much um, 
important advisory missions surrounding the beneficial microbial world. I, I very much wish it were more the, the latter. But so I, I have spent time on boards advising the intelligence community and, and the rest of the US government um, about where there may or may not be legitimate grounds for being worried. So I, I have a little bit of that in the back of my mind, as well as this beneficial microbe perspective. And it makes me confused when I wake up in the morning. Um, one thing I will, I will start by telling you is that we are uh, in the midst of a well-established revolution. Uh, it's an ongoing revolution in the life sciences. Uh, and, and many of you are, are part of that revolution. It began by different people's accounts somewhere way back in the previous century, but certainly by the 1970s when we learned how to manipulate nucleic acids in a deliberate way and stitch them back together. And I mention that because uh, whatever we decide, we think, or don't think about these past two papers, recent papers, that have spawned all this discussion, there are going to be, there have been, as you know, and there will be many more instances like this where we have to stop and think about larger questions. And so I, I think this is going to be an ongoing discussion what we talk about today and what others have been talking about for the last few months. And, and there will be no easy answers, and nor should we think that we have to have them now, because there are going to be many more circumstances that will help refine our thinking. There, there are a couple perspectives that, that participants in the current discussion take. One is the viewpoint of the um, the natural biologist, the person who has been watching what the natural world has spawned in the way of, of microbial um, life, count viruses as life. Um, but this is the, the dark side view of the natural world and where it has um, led to the uh, emergence of, of novel human infectious disease caused by agents that either are themselves novel or appear to be novel because we didn't know anything about them previously and didn't know how to detect them, or, um, or because of changes in the host such that an old organism now causes a new disease. These, are, these appear to be new events. And you will perhaps notice that over here, um, uh, right near Hong Kong, well, on Hong Kong is H5N1 avian influenza, which is only one of a long series of very much unanticipated sometimes dramatic events out of nature in which both recombination and, um, and more stepwise evolutionary paths lead to new influenza viruses that have important potential impact on humans. This label uh, was created back in 1997 when there was the first recognized human disease caused by an influenza virus that was thought to have been previously exclusively of, of bird origin. And, um, and these cases of human disease uh, were, in most cases, fatal and were linked to contact with a domesticated bird population in Hong Kong that had become the new host for this, for this virus. And the, the response was, um, unfortunately, watch people either live or die from this infection in nature. But um, the eradication, oh, extirpation, right? Forgotten what the term is they use, but they they took out all of the, the the chickens in Hong Kong, which were the believed to be the proximate host for this virus. But, but again, the point is, uh, many of these events are occurring, and and people will rightfully argue that um, we're not particularly good at anticipating what happens in nature. We can see these events when they occur in enough people um, with enough peculiar phenotype to cause people to go and say, what, what just happened here? This is, doesn't look like a routine set of deaths. Let's try to figure out what it was. And that's when we learn about these organisms. But there are probably many more events we don't know about. Um, and that leads to this question, which um, is still the subject of a great deal of interesting debate and controversy. So I would say, in favor of the yes answer, would be the, the previous map. Um, we have this rich history of known emergence events. Um, we do know on, on, at the same time that 
not everything can cause disease. In fact, we know particularly now that most microbes do not cause disease. And the ability to cause disease is, although rare, a particularly um, highly tuned trait. Um, and the argument goes, there are going to be plenty more of these things. And, and so we should be very humble in thinking that we have anything to contribute to this um, arms race, you know, contributing arms. The, the no answer um, is based on a couple of things. And it's, it's based upon what I'm suggesting just in very loose terms from that very first slide about the revolution. Um, we humans now have um, the ability to do things in science, in the laboratory, that we could not even have dreamt about 30 years ago, and certainly would not have ever acknowledged as, as realistic even 10 years ago. Um, and that means creating lots and lots of novel sequence, um, putting it into known or even not so known infectious agents to see the effects of those manipulations on, on these microbes. Um, and the other argument I think is important because many of the people in the pathogenesis world have said, uh, sure, you can make all this stuff, but you will never come up with that, that highly evolved trait in a way that will allow the, the, the new pathogen to, to be successful in an evolutionary sense. Because you could make something that, that causes uh, you know, me to be very sick tomorrow. But will it propagate and yet um, persist on the planet? That depends on its ability to adapt and spread, but also not cause such calamitous illness that its hosts are gone, or, or it can't get to the next round of susceptible hosts. So, um, so that's been the, you know, one of the yes arguments, in fact. Um, the no argument today would be to say, wait a minute, you don't have to ask that an organism persist for hundreds of years and become a successfully adapted part of the natural ecosystem. If it goes through enough rounds of propagation in humans and causes enough human disease, in a three-year time period, you could talk about, you'd be talking about a very different world for us. And yet, that's just a little blip in time. And maybe that you know, doesn't mean success for the, from the, the viral point of view. Nonetheless, I think we have to be concerned about that. So um, I, I would say the answer is um, no, not necessarily. So that leads to, to this current issue of um, whether we, in fact, can. And if so, um, what would the thing look like that one would deliberately make and, and cause enough potential consequence for us to be concerned and want to do something unusual um, with the, you know, respect to the conduct of science? And this also is a question that has um, played in the recent press. Um, well, this is really interesting. Something is, I wonder why. OK, for some reason, when I project this, the little circles disappear. Oh, maybe it's on. Yeah, that's why. Um, if, you think about, uh, if you think about the likelihood of something bad of deliberate origins, people, um, you're talking about uh, probably something that's going to be a small number because we don't see it happening much. And that alone would suggest it's small. But we can't, we can't really quantify this thing. And I would say there's some really big error bars around this little small number. We're, we're giving a really gross estimate. Um, and that small number is the product of um, two things, capability and intent. And if this number is small today, it must be because the, the intersection of these two things is small. The number of people who are capable of using, either developing or using a, a biologic agent for ill purposes is small. Or it may be big, but um, in fact, we know it's big. But the overlap of the people who wish to, to do such a thing has to be small. So um, we, again, we don't know what these numbers really are. But if we you know, hypothesize that the consequence could be big, then you're talking about a little number times a big number. You got a huge uncertainty right, of what might be the, you know, the importance of the problem. This didn't work out. But all I can tell you is, although the quantification is very difficult or impossible, I, I'd be willing to, to bet that no matter what the number is today, 
next year it's a little bit bigger. In other words, the, the intersection is probably bigger only because capabilities are spreading around the globe in molecular biology and all the other tools and resources. Um, and it's, it's got to, sooner or later, um, include some of the people who are in this ill-intended category. And again, I don't think we have to argue about whether there are such people. There are public declarations by groups that we know are dedicated to do harm to us that, um, that suggest that one use microbiology to do harm to us. This is out of um, an issue of Inspire, in case you haven't seen last falls, uh, two falls ago issue. Um, so again, we're talking about uncertain numbers, but I think a measurable, I mean, some kind of real number um, in terms of a likelihood that someone will deliberately or perhaps inadvertently um, make use of a biologic agent to do harm. And all these little scenarios, we can't say which is necessarily more likely than another. I have my ideas. You'll have your ideas. Professionals who spend all their day worrying about this have their ideas. I don't think we know. But there are lots of scenarios. And anyone who says um, that someone would be crazy to use an influenza virus to do harm, I think hasn't really thought about the world out there. This is just my personal view of the political landscape. Um, there are people who certainly will do harm to themselves um, uh, in the course of, of attempting to do harm to, to others. So, uh, And then finally, in terms of the consequence bit, um, we're not terribly well prepared for most of the naturally occurring events in nature, including pandemic flu. You may have noticed uh, a year, a year and a half ago, we had a pandemic of a new influenza strain, this H1N1 um, swine origin strain. It fortunately turned out to have relatively low uh, virulence, low case fatality rates, although the age distribution affected is, is very different than a typical seasonal flu strain. Nonetheless, um, fortunately, relatively low virulence. We caught that thing early, and yet even with a vaccine that we knew how to make, um, because it was premised on the exact same molecules that are being used currently for other H1 viruses. Even still, we did not get ahead of that virus. And it spread around the world before we had vaccine even enough for you know, some Americans. So our public health infrastructure and our tools and so forth are not nearly as good as one would like and as one some people think. All right, so finally, um, leading up to these papers. Uh, Back in 2004, this board was established. It was, it was actually a recommendation. It, it, its creation was a recommendation of a, of a National Academies of Science committee uh, known affectionately as the Fink Committee for Jerry Fink at MIT, who chaired it. And the Fink Committee report um, spoke about the problem of dual use science in, in biology and um, how one might think about it's the nature of this kind of dual use science and what one might do to try to mitigate the potential harmful consequences of dual use science. And they said, among many things, why don't you have a board that thinks more carefully about this than we have had a chance to do so? And the government said, fine, they created this. Uh, you can see, you can read this easily. Um, we had our first meeting in 2005. I was asked to join at the beginning. Um, we report to the secretary of HHS, but we also, um, our recommendations are simultaneously transmitted to all of these other agencies because the board and its charter is meant to, um, to be responsive to all federal departments and agencies that fund life sciences research. And there are, I forget the number here, about 16 of them. So, um, so although from a, a sort of administrative point of view, we are housed within the, you know, the offices of HHS, actually in, at NIH, in the Office of Biotechnology Activity, which is the home of the RAC. Um, even though we are, and we report directly to the secretary of HHS, we also report to all these people. And the initial charge had a number of items. Uh, please think about the nature of dual use research of concern. Please help us try to identify that define it in some way. The Fink Committee, and this is what Hank was alluding to, had in its attempt to do so um, given seven examples of experiments they thought would be um, dual use research of concern 
in the life sciences. And these seven categories were things like when you deliberately enhance the virulence of an organism, when you change its host species tropism, when you render it invulnerable to all available drugs, things like that seemed reasonable. So we, we started there and did a little bit of modifying, really. We also have spent a lot of time talking about and writing on oversight of Julius research. And I can point you to the, the website, because there may be things you'll be interested in reading that we've put out there and been sitting at the, bless you, at the, at the NSAVB website for some time now. Um, we, uh, we were asked periodically to look at new classes of experiments and papers that might be, um, that might be problematic. And that gets to this um, charge down here, which was to develop some guidelines on, on how to best communicate research of this type in terms of its methodology and, um, and, and the rationale for undertaking the work at all. And you can read the rest. Education, codes of conduct, um, international dialogue. This is clearly an international issue. And at every point, we have um, acknowledged that and, and tried our best to um, organize international workshops and similar kinds of discussions with international partners. And there's been a lot going on in that as well. And so finally, the, the principles we use for identifying dual use research are shown here. Um, because we're thinking about biosecurity, not biosafety, there are federal, national um, organizations, bodies that are charged with dealing with biosafety. The, the recombinant DNA advisory committee is one. Um, and because that oversight mechanism is already implemented um, around the country, here at Stanford we have a, an institutional biosafety committee that deals with biosafety. We were asked from the beginning to deal instead with biosecurity, which is the information or technologies rather than the agent itself and, and the risks um, that it might pose, they might pose. Um, and we also, I think, tried to emphasize, have always tried to emphasize, that by designating something as dual use research of concern, we do not mean to say that it should not be done um, or that the work and the results shouldn't be communicated. We uh, simply mean to say, this is work that someone other than the investigator ought to think about and look at and discuss at some point early in this process. Um, and it may be decided that it's fine to proceed and there may be some little suggestions that might be made in terms of how it's justified and explained and communicated, um, or maybe more. But that's all this designation really means. And here's the, here's the language that we have um, published in a report several years ago. It's research that can be reasonably anticipated to provide knowledge, products, or technologies that could be directly misapplied by others um, to pose a threat to blah, blah, public health, agriculture, animals, et cetera. So um, this is a very generic, all-encompassing um, line. We used the seven, essentially the seven categories that the Fink Committee described as examples of this. But the reason we wanted to be broader was because well, you know, think about the work that Larry Wine published um, from this university on um, the modeling of the impact that, um, that the introduction of botulinum toxin into the national milk supply might incur. That's something that um, created a lot of discussion prior to our board's existence um, that wouldn't be covered by the, by the Fink Committee. I mean, Larry was doing it was computational work. It was, it was modeling in silico. And yet the information that he generated caused a lot of people to have some concern. So we want to be broader than simply the laboratory experiments that generate something with the following properties. So um, this is, the, this is the, the end here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about, um, about, I guess I should tell you a little bit about the work that's been done. The problem I have is that um, the two papers in discussion right now um, have not been published, as you know. They um, are um, they're privileged. In, it's privileged communication to the journals by the authors. And although um, we on the board have read them, we're not allowed to really talk about the details. Nonetheless, some of the details have been leaked out both by you know, third parties and by the authors. So the parts that I know to be in the public domain, I'm happy to confirm and talk to you about. Um, 
And the timeline to all this is the following. They, um, I don't actually know exactly when these two papers were submitted, but I can tell you that in September, um, I was asked by Science to review their manuscript. Nature had the other. Science's manuscript was the one from, from the Netherlands, from Ron Fouché um, at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. I was asked by Science to review the paper from a biosecurity perspective. They already had science, scientific technical reviews that had said, this work is important, we think it's credible, it's well done, deserves to be published. Science, the editors at Science said, um, this to us seems a little bit concerning. Um, we want others to take a different kind of perspective and look at it from a biosecurity point of view. They have done this in the past, by the way. Um, and we actually had a little discussion about the, the Venter paper um, on the, you know, the, the creation of a synthetic genome that was, you know, made active in a living cell, uh, in a cell. Anyway, so I, um, I did my little review. I expressed a lot of concern. Um, I urged them to consider referring this paper to our board. Uh, they probably heard that from others. In fact, I know they did. And so the, the paper was referred to our board in um, October. And likewise, the, the paper in Nature. And uh, between October 12th and November 21st, we had over 24 hours of teleconference time, the board, a lot of time. And there was a lot of discussion about a whole wide range of issues. A lot of people were, um, you know, came in with one particular point of view and were swayed in a different direction. And it went both ways, actually. Um, and I could tell you more about the makeup of our board, if that helps. But we spent a lot of time. And by the 21st of November, we, um, we transmitted our recommendation to, a, to the Department of, Human, of Health and Human Services. They spent about a week um, trying to decide what to do with our rec We're just advisory. So they had to decide what to do with this recommendation. And at the end of November, they decided they were going to accept our recommendation. And they transmitted that to the two journal editors. And, uh, and since then, the journal editors have been trying to figure out what to do. <laughs> um, you know from, from, from the public media that um, they, have, they are taking our recommendation very seriously. We believe that they will um, uh, work to um, create modified manuscripts that have redacted information. Um, and, and right now, it, the, they have not yet decided to, to release the papers um, because among other things, they're very um, interested in hearing a very explicit, clear plan from the US government about how it, it wishes to um, ensure that the full information be transmitted to whatever number of, of people are determined to be um, in need of the full information. So this, the journals are very concerned that, um, that somebody else be allowed to see the full information, not just our board and them. And when they, when they see a plan that seems clear and, and sensible to them, I think that will be when the papers come out. So the government's working on that. The journals are working on it. That's where it stands. Um, as, uh, as, Her as, um, as Hank already told you, and you know, the, the work um, in these two groups was, was somewhat distinct in its approach. But the purpose was the same, which is to say, um, we have this H5N1 avian flu virus, which is um, known to be highly virulent in, in mammals, and in particular in humans. The, the case fatality rates have been reported around the world, because this virus has spread around the world in bird populations. Um, when it gets into people, the fatality rate has been between 30% and 80%. The reasons for the variation are uncertain. There's been a, a very deliberate effort to see if there might be um, asymptomatic cases of infection in humans in these places where the virus exists. Because that would change our whole thinking about its virulence. If there were millions of people that had antibodies and never been sick, then you'd say, well, maybe this thing is really not that bad. But the result of that work so far says um, there are very, very few people who have antibodies to this virus who have not been sick, really sick. David, if somebody gets infected and 
Um, right, right. So that's the second bullet. Um, the answer right now is no. If, um, if, I became, if, if I became infected yesterday and I have the very first sense of feeling sick, say, tomorrow, here, and I even know what it is. And the reason that we know the answer to this is because there have been um, little clusters of cases where there was a common um, source of exposure. So one person gets sick. It's documented to be H5. The people in the family start getting sick, and you know that that's what it's got to be. So they're rushed to the best place. Hong has some fantastic um, clinical resources and hospitals. They've been given you know, all the antivirals immediately in unusually large doses. They've been supported in all possible ways. And you still end up with an unchanged case fatality rate. What actually kills people? Is this a VRES? It's a, it's, yes. It's, it's a combination of the fact that the virus um, causes um, death to, to the cells it infects deep in the, in the lungs. So there's a lot of necrosis. But the main thing is that it sets off this cascade of, of immune responses, um, a cytokine storm. Yeah. And ARDS-like picture is the result. And so it's, it's the over-exuberant reaction of your immune system that's, that's really doing a lot of the harm here. So adult respiratory distress. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So, so this, is, this, is the pro this is the second problem. Um, you start with a virus that's, that's fairly virulent. In fact, there are very few infectious agents on the planet that have case fatality rates greater than this. I can only think of a couple. Um, and this is way above the, um, the 1918 uh, influenza strain that, that swept the planet. That was um, between 1.8% and 2% fatality. So this is, this is much higher. What's the number of fatalities? The number so far is about, um, there have been about 600 infections, and there are about 400 and something deaths. Yeah. So, so what they did, in case you haven't read you know, USA Today today, um, is that um, they said, this virus has been around since 97. Why hasn't it ever figured out how to become more easily transmitted between person to person, which, which is what all human-adapted influenza viruses do. Influenza is one of these viruses that has um, an incredible means of transmissibility. It's by aerosol route. There aren't many viruses that do that by aerosol route or bacteria. But, but the truly human-adapted influenza strains, like the H1N1 from 2009, they transmit very easily from person to person by aerosol. This has been out there in nature. Scientists have been wondering, why hasn't the, you know, something terrible happened? Why it gets into people, but it doesn't get into the next person? So uh, they said, let's set out to see if we can force it to be this way. Um, and, and one of the groups actually started with um, one of the virulent strains and, um, and made a, a series of deliberate genetic changes um, using the best available information to see if they could make it more easily transmissible between mammals that constitute the best available model of what happens in humans. And that model is the ferret model. Ferrets sounds like a bizarre and you know, out of the way host, but for many, many years, Ferrets have been used as sort of the model for, for understanding influenza virus transmission. For whatever reason, um, it's a good model. It's not perfect, but it's good. So they did all these deliberate changes. Um, that didn't work. Um, they then um, did serial passaging of the virus in ferrets. And what came out in the end, this is all in the public, um, was um, a virus or viruses that um, were now transmitted by respiratory route between ferrets and had still about the same starting case fatality rate, around 50%. This is another thing that a lot of scientists have, have, um, have wondered. If this virus were to acquire the means for aerosol transmissibility, would it then lose its virulence? Would it become attenuated somehow? Now, we don't know. We still don't know whether that would happen if this virus became highly transmissible in people. But in these ferrets, at least on initial, you know, the initial output from the serial passaging was a virus that had not lost its virulence. So as best we can tell now, we have to consider the possibility they've made a virus that has around 50% case fatality and is pretty easily transmitted, potentially, from person to person by aerosol route. 
So now you're talking about a virus that we, in 2009, could not stop um, even with available vaccines. And um, in this case, we wouldn't be able to treat either. So, um, so, so that, that leads to a pretty significant kind of risk. You're talking about um, millions of deaths, if not more than millions. Some have talked about something bigger. Um, so why, why would you do this work? What are the potential benefits? Well, um, some of these scientists have said in public that their interest was in reversing this, um, these assumptions by the public health community, by policymakers, by scientists, that this virus, H5N1, can't ever do it. It's just biologically incapable of it. Um, they said, by showing that we had made such a thing, it, it would raise awareness and hopefully motivate people to say, maybe we were wrong to be you know, sort of downplaying the importance of these viruses out there in nature. And just because they haven't done it doesn't mean they won't. And maybe they will soon. Who knows? Um, they have also said that they believe that the exact genetic makeup of these viruses they have made will help us recognize when or if um, such viruses, similar viruses, arise in nature through the surveillance system. But they haven't explained exactly how that will be implemented, where, and, and when this particular benefit might be realized. And I'd be happy to talk to you more about this. But it turns out that we're actually not doing a whole lot of virus sequencing out in the places of the world where H5N1 is. In fact, we only sequence when there's a dead body of some kind, and it takes weeks. And this is a virus that moves pretty quickly. So I'm personally very skeptical about this second benefit. The third benefit they have claimed is that by knowing what this, this potential future virus looks like now, we could um, ensure that we have drugs and vaccines that work against it. And we can talk more about that. I'm, again, a little bit doubtful that, that it was necessary to do exactly this to learn that. But it, it, that's, that's out there as well. So. Um, that leads to this, to this um, you know, the, the big question. Um, how, do you, how do you do the trade-off here? Um, how do you quantify things that are hard to quantify, but in the end, balance these risks against these benefits? And who makes the decision on behalf of whom? And, and are there, you know, what are the various kinds of, of, of decisions um, and steps that one should undertake? Should the work have been done? Um, if so, by whom? Under what conditions? And what do you do with the information that's revealed? Um, there's general information, like, we did it. Trust us, we did it. Scientists have reviewed these data. They confirm it looks like we made this thing we say we have made. That's one kind of information. Another is, here is the genetic blueprint for these viruses. Here are their sequence. Um, remember, if you're not familiar, um, the sequence allows potentially a lot of people to be able to recreate this thing on their own. Um, because the, you know, the genetic engineering of flu viruses is a pretty routine, um, pretty routine activity for, those, for, for certain classes of virologists and molecular biologists. Um, so, so the board's recommendation, in case I probably should have made that clear, was um, that there were sig significant enough benefits in this bullet here to, um, to warrant publication of a very brief communication that essentially says, this is why we set out to do this work, and it did work. Um, we need, we need to, to you know, devote a lot more resource to this potential issue in terms of, of um, vaccine, vaccine infrastructure, drug development, drug distribution, all of the public health things that would go along with it. Um, but we also recommended that the genetic blueprint not be revealed to the general public. Um, we were not, um, I think, naive enough to think that it wouldn't be available if one really, really wanted to try to find it. Because Ron Fouchier went out and talked about his work at a small meeting, you know, a month after he completed the experiments. And, you know, it, this was not done on a classified basis. This information is sitting on computers and in notebooks and in these labs, and colleagues have been told about it. So we know that it can be learned. But we just thought, why make it that much easier? 
for those that might wish to do harm? Or why make it easier for this virus to be located in that many more labs that don't really need to have this virus, which can escape? So that's, that's what we recommended. And um, what is now done is, you know, remains to be seen. I think we all agree that um, this really should have been, this discussion should have happened much, much earlier. This is a, a, a kind of a crazy situation to find yourself in. This is not how any of us would have wanted it. We were never asked when Ron Fouchier said, I have an idea. We weren't asked to comment. Um, we were asked to comment only when there was a finished manuscript um, accepted for publication. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of things we could talk about in terms of, you know, how this might go differently in the future. But um, I, I think I'll just stop and let you guys, you know, offer your suggestions and ideas. Mildred. I have a ton of questions, and I'll just ask a couple, just a couple for clarification. So who funded that research? And that was your question. question. Yeah. Yeah. And another one was about the, um, both of these kind of get to sort of like, what are the enforcement potentials here? Like, one is our enforcement or review or oversight. So one is the grant, you know, giving the grants out, and that would be a bit of a potential point. And another one is, a question I have is, so what is the, um, you guys make recommendations to do DHHS, and they have some scope over who and how, and presumably nature is based in the UK, not in the US, even though they have US offices. So they, it seems like they voluntarily agreed to kind of go along with this? Or yes, what is so, so the, the status of these recommendations and, and communications to the journals is simply a, vol a request that they voluntarily undertake these, you know, these actions, the redaction. Um, there's actually a, I don't agree with everything in it, but there's a piece that you probably read by Larry Gostin in Science um, a few weeks ago on sort of the legal aspects of um, trying to control work of this sort. And at this point, in, with this kind of work, there, as you know, there aren't many. Um, it was. To answer your first question, it was funded by the NIH, um, in part. Uh, a whole lot of questions, of course, <laughs> that then leads to. Um, they didn't talk to us. They didn't also talk to um, OBA, our little you know, management group at, at NIH, as far as I know. Which is? Um, NIAID, Anthony S. Fauci, director. Um, so, so actually, it was interesting. Um, yeah, NIH money went to both groups, both the one at Wisconsin and the one in Rotterdam. And um, there were no, as far as we know, no stipulations in the grant agreement. So the grants can say, by the way, you know, certain parts of this information, you know, we'd like to limit distribution or we have some rights to this or whatever. There wasn't anything like that. One of them, the Rotterdam Group, actually funded through a contract mechanism with NIH money, but their contract apparently, according to the public media, also did not have clauses that would have attempted some limitation of communication or possession or whatever. So um, that's how it was done. As you know, um, work done by NIH, in fact, work done at any institution that receives NIH funding is subject to regulations having to do with biosafety. Um, but as yet, our ideas of a similar oversight mechanism for biosecurity have not been implemented or even thought through all the way down to the grassroots level, like here. And so there isn't even that for this kind of, well, this had biosafety issues, but the biosecurity part isn't articulated anywhere. David, were there any questions in the reviews? of the proposals about the possible events that might happen from this gate? I mean, are, are those comments public or uh, in the grant review from committees and panels? Uh, which review? Well, uh, I, presumably they had to turn in a grant to get funded. Yeah. So they were yeah. reviewed by a, a group of experts. Did, they, did the experts say anything about You know, words? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I do know from public statements that um, 
it was clear that they were starting with the wild type, the, the fully virulent, naturally occurring avian influenza virus, H5N1. That virus um, requires um, what's called BSL-3 enhanced um, biocontainment conditions. So that's someplace between three and four, four being the ultimate highest, for which there are very few facilities around the world for work. Um, the NIH did say this must be done at BSL-3 plus enhanced. Um, but there weren't, I, I don't know anything else about, you know, whether there were requirements that were imposed. Okay, would you say grant no. I think it is fair to say that occasionally grant applications get money for things that maybe they've already done and the money that they get from the application is used mm -hmm. for something mm -hmm. else or something mm -hmm. furthering it. Mm -hmm. I wonder if reviewers would have known from the application that this was something that they actually intended to do under this grant. I think it was pretty clear. That's my guess. And in particular, I think it was very clear that Fouchier intended to do this work because it was a contract to do it. So there wasn't any ambiguity about what was both intended and what was, you know, what, what was intended by either party. So somebody had to know this was happening. Yes. Just didn't yes. realize yes. what kind of controversy. It, it just, I think it just went right under the radar screen. And that, to me, is a very um, sad thing because we would like to think that we have at least sensitized people at NIH about our existence, you know, and that there are these issues and that there ought to be a more thorough review of things that come through that institution, but apparently, <coughs> I, I think so, I think so, yeah. You know, and the other thing, to be fair, is that um, there has been work on, on H5N1 that's been done, as you've read. Um, people have done experiments that I think today now we might look, a, look at a little differently. Not of this sort, but, you know, potentially concerning and probably deserving of at least more review than it had at the time. So, Doug. A question for Hank. If this strain does get out and, and cause a pandemic or, or to kill people, this exact strain with those eight mutations in it, uh, would that group, the research group, then be uh, liable for criminal or terrorism charges? Unlikely that they would be liable for any criminal charges unless you could show negligence or recklessness, I suppose. Well, publishing a sequence of a, well, a so, terror well, so two different. I, I read your question a little diff differently when you said "get out." I actually thought you meant the virus escaped. No, I meant the something. idea of getting out and the exact strain with those eight mutations infecting. Not getting out of the lab. Right. Okay. I mean, so, so somebody I takes mean, the information yeah. from the publication, replicates it. Yeah. One of the people who was then, reading inspired. So. I think a criminal charge would be a stretch, but I could imagine maybe on a reckless or negligent homicide kind of theory. I'm looking at at least one other, one law student in the room, Amy, what do you think? I think not. I think you might stretch. get some civil liability there, but I would be very surprised. There may be, yeah, there could be some civil liability. On the other hand, at least that's in the United States. We've seen that there are countries that are willing to go after scientists criminally for stuff that kind of surprises me, like the Italian seismologists being uh, prosecuted for their earthquake prediction, or lack of earthquake prediction. And then the French and some of the HIV stuff, I thought, went a little broader than I would expect. So I don't think, I, I think criminal liability is unlikely. Civil liability, conceivable. Although civil liability will affect their institutions much more than they themselves. Rather than the institution, could it be directed at the publications? Or then I should they choose to publish it as opposed to. I, I can certainly. If I were a plaintiff's lawyer, I would name the publications. But you name everybody. And if they did it now, that's very different from if they had done it without consulting you. I mean, they've been informed of all right. the risks and it's been fully aired, so if they take that risk now, they can't. Yeah. I, I, we've been on plenty of conference calls with the, the journal editors, and I can tell you they certainly feel that kind of responsibility yeah, now. Another lawyer in here, Matt. Do you have any? I mean, I think you have a very good civil case, and especially when you think not just in terms of um, can you get a judgment, but 
<laughs> I think you would, you, from the plaintiff side, you would have, from a practical standpoint, a lot of. Um, You'd have a lot of leverage for settlement. Yeah, exactly. So there's a causation problem there if you have a, a, the intervening actor who right. is a, uh, I mean, if, if you got a terrorist who copied the and released it, that's a superseding cause. Could be a great tort suit issue <laughs> about proximate cause. It sounds like a fun thing for its class. I think it would keep, I think lawyers would have a fun time with it. As long as they were getting paid. Well, as long as they were still alive. In terms of, I mean, the wild type virus could mutate through totally different mechanisms. And secondly, if you were developing a vaccine, it wouldn't necessarily be against the targets that make the virus uh, more easily transmissible. You're exactly right. So uh, I think that is some of the presumption for uh, having this organism. It would seem like you need a uh, vaccine against this virus as it is. Yes. We already, we, the public health system made modestly significant efforts to, um, moderate significant efforts to, to develop an H5 vaccine about four or five years ago. There was more interest in this virus four or five years ago. There were some efforts made to make an H5N1 vaccine. It was actually a vaccine trial here at Stanford. Um, it turns out that you need about 10 times the amount of protein to stimulate not even as good an immune response to that virus as you need um, protein of the same family type for the current H1 viruses that we have seen many times before and, and hence are much more able to respond to in, from, a, from a vaccine point of view. So vaccine development is going to be hard, but I, I personally agree with you that um, we know enough now about how to make a more generic H5N1 vaccine that would cover any of the things that they describe and perhaps the countless hundreds or thousands or more others that, that might be the ones that arise in nature. And so your first point is also a really good one. I will tell you that the two papers don't necessarily describe the same mutations, and that's just you know two out of two. So think about how many more. So, so one of them has said, that's exactly why we need a whole lot more work of exactly the type I just did to learn what all of them are. Or not. Yeah, but uh, that uh, the one then wonders uh, whether this is being done on purpose in order to make vaccines. Yeah, hard, hard to say, of course. <laughs> A lot. There's already this controversy about uh, people not wanting their vaccines anymore, and if that gets to be a purpose, then uh, you know, let's just try more organisms to make more vaccines. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you can always come back to the fact that there are these real um, infectious disease threats in nature mm -hmm. that we know infect people at some rate, for which we know we need. Yeah, yeah. Could you speak a little bit more into, in terms of the um, the risks and opportunities of delineating the biosecurity versus biosafety question, and whether this has been an ongoing dialogue with folks at RAC um, and otherwise, just in terms of how you would build a, a distributed infrastructure to look over biosecurity issues? Is this sort of the wrap up those questions? Yeah. <laughs> and um, just a personal opinion on how effective that would be? Um, so this. This was sort of the, the, the notional idea of an oversight system that we have talked about in recent years. Um, it, it's based locally, as, as is the IBC system, um, because, because no matter what, you have, to, you have to think that the first person that's aware of an idea that may prove to be of concern is the person having the idea. You have to hope that you capture um, that source at the earliest possible moment. And that's a local thing. There aren't people going to Washington and then having their ideas about a research proposal or some experiments. They're having them here at, you know, at Pete's Coffee or something. 
Um, we also can't expect that every single idea that comes out of someone's head must be reviewed by someone else. So, and this is the way the bio, I'm, I'm actually the chair of the biosafety committee here, is we know that there's work being done here that someone didn't think to tell us about that they should have. But all we can do is, is try to you know, go out and talk to people, and we have people that mix and mingle and you know, tell us about what you're doing kind of thing. But in the end, we have to hope that someone says, I know what you're talking about because you've educated me about this dual use research of concern issue. So I'm going to now tell you about this one experiment I had, which is pretty unusual for me and for the rest of us, that I think someone else ought to look at. And, and the idea right now is to do a very similar thing. Have um, either a local committee, and we could talk about whether it should be the biosafety committee or not. Personally, I think it's going to have to, it's going to entail a lot more resource because we're up to here right now with what we do. And, and the people on our committee don't necessarily have that kind of educational there, sensitization. Is there funding right now to do sort of organizational strategy on a distributed network like this? Is, this? is there a place where that type of work or funding yeah, information can find its way? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. And there are some local regions that have, like Duke, for example, has already stood up something that they're proposing as a model. And they do it within a network of, of universities that participate in a, um, a regional center grant from NIAID okay. on biodefense. So um, there are people trying to think about ways of doing this. And I know that. Um, that NIH and OBA are, are developing this in much greater detail. They're just not sure, you know, how do you fund it? How do you, how do you develop standards? Yeah. You know, the problem has been that there have been very few instances where you can point to something that, that everyone agrees is dual use research of concern. And a lot of things you can say are not. And, and so until now, in fact, maybe one of the hidden benefits of this is that, A, a lot more people are talking about this and are aware. B, maybe we, ha we now have you know, some case law or you know, case examples that can be used um, to illustrate what the principles behind that, that criterion that we've tried to promote and help educate. Um, well, just a partial answer to that question, we um, there's, uh, there's a, uh, sort of network of institutions that's been built by NIH that have funding for clinical research and it's through this thing called the CTSA program, the Clinical Translational Sciences Award. And there's 60 of those around the country and Stanford is a CTSA site. Um, I'm sure you're, you've been sucked in at some level, but part of that um, network also involves a, um, uh, the provision of services to clinical researchers for ethics consultation. And that actually was something that was started at Stanford many years ago, and it's been adopted through the CTSA network. So part of that is to try to get local with um, ways to identify things like this at the early stages of the research project. So, but again, it does depend on largely on investigators realizing that they have an idea that needs to go to the blue arrow and not to the green arrow. But it involves also more opportunities for interaction with this mix and mingle kind of idea or a biostatistician talking with a researcher who says, oh, and I want to go sample these people and you know, here's my study design and the biostatistician might be the one that says, oh, I think I need to call the ethics center. And then I would say, oh, I think I need to call David Roman. And that's how it would you know, yeah. kind of go that way. So there is a sort of growing national um, potential service that would address that that issue. Um, but can I ask a question, too, uh, kind of related to this? Because um, I read the articles that were published by the researchers in science as a kind of like giving us a little sense of what the debate was like. And I don't know if you could say a little bit more about that, but it did seem like there was a lot of foot dragging or sort of like, well, we, we want to put this moratorium in place because we know we have to because it's a PR problem, but not because there's any underlying actual risk. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just, uh, I don't know, that sort of, well, one specific question I had was, what is the meaning of the 60-day moratorium? Is it, what is it a moratorium on? And um, we, well, how do you think yeah. that that? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, they, I mean, they didn't come to us with this idea. Oh, they, really? No. 
um, these 39 virologists got together, wrote up a, a proposal, and, and submitted it on their own. Um, they, I think, were playing off of news that we were talking about a moratorium. But our, our idea of a moratorium was because we were counseled that it might be very difficult to ask the research community to stop work. Boom. Put down your pipettes. Um, we, our idea for a moratorium was on the further communication of research in this area until we had, until we had, had um, the, right, the, the kinds of discussions that were both global and dealt with um, these issues of how do we define what's appropriate and not, um, what should go forward and for what purpose, and how we, are we going to be very clear and explicit about the benefits to know that they are real and being achieved um, versus work that probably shouldn't go forward. That we were hoping would be done in an international setting, probably in multiple places involving lots of different people. And frankly, I think it's going to take longer than 60 days. But my own personal you know, sense of the tone from their thing is, um, please just let us be. If this is what we have to do to, to reassure you that we're responsible citizens, fine. But we really would like to continue doing our work as we were before, unfortunately. By my account, I, I I think there are a lot of people. One thing that have not had a chance to be heard at all. I mean, the people in this room are one, but everyone on the street who reads this has a very you know visceral reaction, and that has not been heard. And it doesn't seem, doesn't feel as though these scientists are all that particularly interested in in all of the the stakeholders here. Two questions and a comment. Um, first question. What you said that if science, if the editors of science had brought this to you personally, well, the I, I think they said maybe might never have found out about it until these were published. Um, yeah, I have to be careful because I don't know everything. Right. Um, I I know that they sent it to more than me for a biosecurity review. So they those they, people may have said the same they thing. Sent it out to anybody for biosecurity. That's right. If they hadn't thought about biosecurity issues. That's right. You would have found out about it when it hit the paper. That's right. That's right. Yes. That's right. Second, um, just your own gut sense, the argument that this was research worth doing so that we could find out whether a highly virulent, uh, a highly infectious version of this was possible at all mm -hmm. to affect our sense of just how worried we should be about it. I, I have mixed feelings about that argument. What do you think about it? Personally? Yeah. I mean, the. So this is not I'm not speaking on behalf of the board. Personally, um, I think there are now scientific experiments that I can think up that I think shouldn't be done. I think um, not all science um, needs to be done just because someone thought it up and thought it might be an interesting experiment. So, so the answer is no. I actually don't. Given what I know now, I don't think I would want to see this experiment done so until it can be explained to me better. Is it kind of a universal precaution sort of thing? Is we should worry about it whether or not we've got evidence that it can happen? Yes, yes. I, I think there's plenty of reason already to have been concerned about H5N1 and be concerned about H7N2. And there are a whole bunch of other high pathogenic avian viruses out there, too. So yeah. And then the comment, I worry a little bit about local regulation in this context yeah. with IRBs, IACUCs, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, safety committees. A, you've already got a lot of it, but B, those are typically aimed at process. You can almost always get something through the IRB and the animal panel and the biosafety. You just have to modify how you're going to do it. Yeah. This one is more: can you actually do this research? Period. Yeah. And with the local institution with the incentives to get research funding and do research, I worry a little bit more that. Well, the institution may may soon realize that they have some liability and responsibility here. Um, there are experiments today that are proposed, which, from a biosafety point of view, get referred to the RAC. I mean, local IBCs, on a regular basis, not frequently, on a regular basis, are saying, "Wait a sec, that even we know in the guidelines warrants a review higher up than than us." And that's what we in, imagine here as well. And that there will be some top-down aspects of this in which a national board or a series of boards is trying to provide guidance. What are 
if University of Wisconsin got any public relations pushback from they did. Um, if you read the Madison paper, <laughs> there's, there's a whole lot of stuff about, um, you know, about the, um, the trustworthiness of this guy and whether he really did stuff you know, at the level of safety that he said he did. And you know, the, the local community is very concerned. I mean, they're living next to you know, something that others have told them. The New York Times just told them that they're living next to the doomsday virus. How would you feel? <laughs> we have time for a couple more questions. Just a short one. Mm. Um, you said at the top that the journal editors were thinking about how or who to distribute the full information to you know, on a need to know basis. Do you have any yeah. thoughts on who those groups would be? Yeah, that's what the board is now is now deliberating. Um, Defense agencies or other biologists? That's, I think it's a really, really hard one. Um, in some ways, you could be talking about, you'd be talking about the people who can best make use of the information to develop countermeasures um, through paths that we now understand. This is the whole problem with you know, trying to limit the openness in science in general. Sometimes the most incredibly revolutionary idea comes out of left field from somebody that you never would have named on your list of need to know. That's the problem. But I don't see how you can do otherwise here. So I think you'd have to think through exactly who needs this information for what purpose and, um, and try to sort it out that way. And I, I think probably fewer rather than more, just because I'm doubtful that anyone's going to make great use of this information in the near term, frankly. I was on a couple of radio shows about this with Bruce Alberts, who's the publisher, editor, editor. editor of science. And he mm -hmm. was seemed really sincerely worried about that part. They didn't want to be stuck with a mandate to distribute this to the right people without being told who the how it was going to be done. Exactly. exactly. They didn't want that problem. No, exactly, exactly, exactly. I, would anyone have any ideas? I mean, we're all ears. <laughs> there are people who are thinking, you know, should this should work like this, or even this work be classified? That provides a very ready mechanism and lots of rules. Um, should it be, um, uh, let's see, what's the term? Um, CUI. Um, it's the new, you know, sensitive but unclassified. It's uh, con not confidential. It, um, Plus or not to you. <laughs> yeah, right. But the problem is these are U.S. mechanisms, and this is the world we have to well, deal with. Controlled but unclassified. That's the new term for all of that, sir. You know, if they turn it down, there's a lot of other editors who would. Well, um, if this had remained a little local dispute, yeah, I think now, if these papers appear in their you know full glory in some other journal, uh, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of answers to, I mean, questions to. Well, they have thought about doing that actually. Yeah. Yeah, and you know that if WikiLeaks or um, what are they called, autonomous, want this out there, they'll find it and get it out there. So I, you know, we have to be kind of realistic. But I think there's some important principles being made by sort of, you know, planting a flag or drawing a line, um, and it may not be successful in preventing this from being disseminated, but it may slow it down, and it certainly will sensitize a lot of people. Yeah. How much have experiments like the ones? Spoke of in terms of other distributed structures for oversight mm -hmm. uh, helped inform the recommendations that you're, you're able to make. How practical is some of those experiments been? Living experiments. Um, so, other examples of limited distribution? Is that what you mean? Yeah, and, and also in, in terms of being able to flag certain types of research that, that might need additional. Well, I, I can tell you, as far as I know, and the board knows um, there's never been a recommendation to redact information in, in scientific work that began in the open. Never. And as far as other reviews, we've looked at maybe, you know, five to ten other papers over the last number of years that came to us. And in many cases, we recommended that the purpose be better explained so the public could understand, that greater detail be provided on on measures that were taken, in fact, for safety and security that they didn't describe. 
Um, we never asked anyone to take something out or not publish so far. That's why this is an interesting discussion, because it's new. This is a new territory. It's fine by me. Yeah, you know. I'm sorry, we had a, a popular culture reference for the uh, reading amusement of any years of art. There's a science fiction author named Myra Grant who has written three books on exactly this scenario. Uh, as you would expect for a very popular culture writer, uh, the, it was not a disease that had a high mortality rate. Instead, it turned people into zombies. Uh, and yeah, I think I know this one. It's a marvelous uh, intrigue about who was responsible and for what, for what reasons. That one was already released, that virus. Excuse me? You haven't noticed? Uh, <laughs> sorry. Right. <laughs> now, uh, that's a concern that <clears throat> but politically we've already listened to simple things turned into the politics of pet panels. And something like this could very easily get into, uh, into the open, become a big campaign issue at funding by yeah, the NIH. The NIH, what are they doing? The NIH. Um, I will tell you, in, in, a real risk. I, I absolutely agree with you. I, when I read this after I first I was sort of aghast at the fact they had done this, um, one of the consequences I thought of from my own self interested perspective was. What is this going to do to NIH funding because of how people perceive that what are today incredibly limited precious resources were used in such a sort of a wantonly irresponsible manner? I'm, yeah, I'm very concerned about that. I'm, so far, as far as I know, it has not become a big issue on Capitol Hill, but they've been distracted by some things. But, you know, no one can predict. I, I, I could see where in some, you know, in some kind of, of Political construct, this becomes a useful angle. The step still fight, though. I don't see this as necessarily being a left, right, Democrat, Republican. The scientists will get dumped on from every side of this. The, the virologists who did this are trying to turn this into, this is my sense, into a um, virologist slash, you know, well intentioned scientist versus biosecurity expert argument. And I think what they have missed, I hope, is that. There are many more of us who are actually scientists, but aware of this other potential risk um, that just simply haven't spoken up. And I know plenty of them that have talked to me, come up to me, and but um, they're organized, and and you know many of the rest are not. So any of you that have ideas of trying to promoting a more balanced discussion, it, it's becoming a bit polarized, is what worries me. It almost sounds like, you know how they have this thing when you apply for the grants, there's this data sharing plan that you're supposed to, mm -hmm. you have to fill out, and you have to say, mm -hmm. you know, when I get this federal money, mm -hmm. I have to, you know, swear that I'm going to share the data because it's public and blah, 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 and this is how I'm going to do it. It's almost like you need kind of the flip side of that. On the other hand, if I get data that I shouldn't share, then this is how I'm going to do yeah. it. And they're, you know, and I know that as part of this, um, Ethics Consultation Service, we have actually gotten a few calls from study sections that are reviewing a grant saying, oh, I think there might be a problem here that might warrant actually not awarding this grant or not renewing this grant. So, you know, that seems like an odd way to go for an institution that whose job is to review the grant, so they should have the capability in yeah. house to do that yeah. and to catch things in a way. Well, as you know, they have relied largely on the extramural community to do this. And right. The extramural community is not entirely uniformly up to speed on this at all. A lot of people I've spoken to say, someone did that. I hadn't actually even thought about someone wanting or doing that sort of thing. And you know, oh my god, I just realized what that could mean kind of thing. Well, yeah. I, so the answer to your first question is um, NIH, well, basically, it was H the secretary of HHS who signed this, this recommendation, this, this request to the journals an endorsement of our recommendation. So she told the NIH, you know, you will now enable this to happen and all the other things. And one of the first things I know they did is they turned right around and they looked 
really hard at all of their grants to see what other H5N1 work they have funded to see, because they realized maybe they didn't know. So they're doing that now. And, but it's got to be broader, and uh, we, don't, we don't know how that's exactly going to happen. Two last, and then we really do need to let David get back to his important work. Mm -hmm. I've already asked you a question. Well, I guess the question, just generally speaking, as a result of this research, at least when I'm thinking about it, I can't think of any legitimate reason why this should have been funded, especially by the federal government. So has anything, um, I guess, any proposals been made to restrict categories of research that receive funding from the NIH and NSF and other um, organizations within the feds, or at least create like an automatic screening process. I know on the board you, it seemed like it really was relying a lot on local institutions um, to kind of handle the review process, but have there been any proposals for setting up categories of research that automatically mm. warrant screening? No, it's an interesting question. The, 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 the practical difficulty with doing that kind of thing is that if you look at the, at the FINK seven categories of concern, um, it covers pretty much half of all of the work that's being done around the world in, in microbial pathogenesis. You know, why is this thing virulent? Well, um, and usually the approach is we knock this out to see if it loses virulence, but sometimes you do that and the thing gains virulence just because you didn't know. So, um, so you have to be careful that you're not going to bite off this huge thing and, and have a lot of noise that doesn't have true signal. A and I don't know how best to do that. The idea has been have multiple levels, have this local thing, but also have, you know, reviews at the study section level, also have reviews maybe at the, at the institutional level, at the funding level, and at the, at the journal level. I, all the ASM journal editors um, have a little, you know, when you submit an article to any of the American Society for Microbiology journals, you have to um, check a box that says, you know, this does or does not have potential dual use research of concern implications and explain yourself. And NIH is starting to do it on grant applications, but it, right now it just has to do with select agents, which is this limited list of concerning organisms. But I think, I think you're exactly right. There has to be something um, broader and more inclusive that happens uh, across a larger amount of science, but it doesn't become so burdensome that you know, the scientific enterprise just grinds to a halt, which a lot of people are rightfully worried about as well. It's a, sort of a fine line. It's hard. Maybe a personal reflection from you on how you came to be an advisor on biosecurity issues in your professional career and how those sort of opportunities to train scientists in these questions could be distributed in a more meaningful way. So what is sort of the training element given that study sections and institutional you know, review boards of, of, of all sorts are staffed by peers, right? Yeah. By our own. Um, well, I'm just trying to think of, of what is relevant in my past that yeah. is, can be generalized. I, I guess th there are two things. One is um, I was working before I worked on the benefit. I worked on disease-causing microbes. And I was particularly interested in developing methods to detect novel disease-causing organisms that occur naturally, naturally. And, and so just because I did that kind of work and people knew about it, um, I was invited to serve on these review panels and advisory panels. But I think the, the more important thing is its relationships. So I actually got to know people that I never, ever would have met, for sure, or known that I'd met. And, um, and realized that, A, you know, a, a reasonable number of them are really well-intentioned, smart people who are trying to do a really difficult thing, which is anticipate risks of a sort that don't happen often, about which we don't have a lot of you know, scientific basis for understanding or anticipating, and yet, you know, it's important to do, at least to think about, because, you know, we live in a very imperfect world. So, uh, and, and it's going to depend on personality and how you see the world and how well you can compartmentalize this kind of thing, because it's, it can become depressing uh, if you spend too much time on it, so, yeah. Well, on that uplifting note. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome.